SpaceX and Launcher release incredible engine test footage, we say hello to a mesmerizing total solar eclipse, and farewell at Delta's final flight. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday the 12th of April, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. This week we had some awesome footage of engine testing coming from Launcher and SpaceX on two very different engines that are pretty amazing to watch in action. Not only is the footage incredible, but it also highlights some peculiarities about each of these engines. Launcher's E2 engine has been in development for quite some time, and the company was able to test fire it for the first time all the way back in November of last year. Back then, the engine was firing for short periods of time at a much lower throttle setting and a high fuel-rich mixture ratio. The engine burns kerosene on an oxidizer-rich combustion cycle engine, meaning that the engine is closed cycle and uses an oxidizer-rich pre-burner to run its turbo pump. The footage from this week shows that the engine is now firing at full thrust and nominal mixture ratio, and, of course, since it is a Carolox engine, its exhaust is… blue? Wait, it's kind of a rule of thumb nowadays, isn't it? If it's Carolox, it's orange exhaust, and if it's methane, it's either blue or purplish in color. So why is this Carolox engine blue? Well, it all has to do with its mixture ratio. While the mixture ratio indicates that the engine still runs fuel rich, it runs closer to the ideal ratio than other kerosene fueled engines. This means that the combustion is hotter and more energetic, which translates into an amazing blue exhaust with tons of orange in it. The engine is able to achieve these high combustion temperatures by using liquid oxygen as a coolant on certain parts of the engine instead of just using kerosene as the cooling fluid. This also explains why other engines with the same fuel, engine cycle, and mixture ratio, such as the RD-180, still burn orange. Those engines use a lot of kerosene on their exhaust to cool down the inside of the combustion chamber and nozzles. Now let's go to the other engine with blue exhaust, the Raptor engine. SpaceX shared this amazing slow motion footage of a Raptor vacuum engine being tested at the company's McGregor facility. In the video, the engine is in the process of shutting down. And take a look at the rings that form and travel inside of the nozzle as it ramps down in power. These rings show up due to a phenomenon known as flow separation. This flow separation occurs when the atmospheric pressure tries to squish the exhaust, so to speak, after it exits the engine nozzle. As the engine ramps down in power, the pressure of the exhaust also goes down, and then the air starts winning and tries to force itself into the nozzle, creating oscillations and rings within the exhaust. It's for this reason that the RVAC engine is always fitted with a support ring near the end of its large nozzle extension so that these oscillations don't destroy the engine while it's being tested at sea level. It's incredible to see just how much happens in a very short amount of time when an engine is running, or rather stops running, like in this case. The whole shutdown process takes barely over a second long. Who knew something as simple as shutting down could be so fascinating to watch? Now let's take a look at This Week in Launches. Starting off the week, we had the first of four Falcon 9 launches. Liftoff from Vandenberg took place on April 7th at 2.25 UTC, carrying a batch of Starlink satellites into low Earth orbit. However, this was not a usual batch of Starlink satellites. This was the first launch of the new Group 8 missions that carry a subset of Starlink direct-to-cell satellites on board. For this mission, 15 of the satellites were Starlink V2 mini satellites, and the other six were Starlink direct-to-cell. This mission kickstarts the operational deployment of SpaceX's first constellation of direct-to-cell satellites that the company aims to complete by August. Michael Nichols, vice president of Starlink Engineering, stated on social media that future launches will carry up to 13 direct-to-cell satellites instead of six. The launch occurred near sunset, which also meant a lot of people in the southwest of the U.S. and northwest Mexico got spooked. The flight was visible as far east as Arizona, where our own writer Justin Davenport took a shot of the launch. As usual, Falcon 9's first stage for this mission was flight proven. Booster B-1081 was flying for a sixth time, and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship Of Course I Still Love You. This was the fastest turnaround time for the launch pad and drone ship at just under five days, but the record for the pad wouldn't last that long, as you'll see later. Less than a day after that launch, we had another Falcon 9 mission, this time taking place from Launch Complex 39A in Florida. Liftoff occurred on April 7th at 2316 UTC, and it was carrying the first of a new series of SpaceX-dedicated rideshare missions, Bandwagon 1. 
Bandwagon missions are part of SpaceX's SmallSat rideshare program, and they are a continuation of the company's transporter missions. While transporter missions were rideshare missions to sun-synchronous orbit, bandwagon missions instead fly to mid-inclination orbits. These mid-inclination orbits allow for more regular passes of mid-latitude locations than on sun-synchronous orbits, despite the different illumination that takes place on every pass for mid-inclination orbits. However, there are payloads that don't even need to have the ground illuminated at all, but could still benefit from more frequent passes. It's no surprise, then, that only one of the 11 payloads on this mission was dedicated to optical imaging of the ground. This flight featured the second satellite of South Korea's Project 425 Reconnaissance Satellite Program, which uses synthetic aperture radar for imaging. On board were also Capella Space's Capella 14 and IQPS QPS SAR 7 satellites, which are also synthetic aperture radar imaging satellites. The other payloads featured on this flight were the TSAT 1A Earth Observation Satellite, this is the one with the optical imaging payload, the Centauri 6 satellite, which is a 12U CubeSat for Internet of Things applications, and six Hawkeye 360 satellites for RF detection and signal intelligence gathering. The first stage for this mission, B-1073, was flying for a 14th time, and it successfully returned for a land landing at SpaceX's Landing Zone 1, blasting the Space Coast with sonic booms. This was the 300th orbital flight of a rocket within the Falcon family since the last failure, the Amos 6 explosion back in 2016. The Falcon rocket family therefore becomes the first in history to achieve this milestone, which still continues to grow. This week, we also had the 16th and final flight of United Launch Alliance's Delta IV Heavy rocket. This final liftoff took place on April 9th at 1653 UTC from Space Launch Complex 37B in Florida. The rocket was carrying the NROL-70 payload for the National Reconnaissance Office. Since the payload was classified, we don't really know much about it, but there are clues as to what it might be. The size of the rocket, the trajectory of the rocket, and the hazard zones for this mission give us only one potential possibility for what the payload was. Most likely an Orion Signal Intelligence Gathering satellite, or essentially a big satellite with a big antenna in geostationary orbit that listens for signals from other satellites. This was the final launch of the most metal of rockets, and ends the long story of the Thor and Delta rockets, which have accumulated more than 700 launches spread over more than 65 years. In particular, this was Delta's 389th and final launch since its first flight in 1962. ULA's other legacy rocket, the Atlas V, still has a few more missions to do, especially in support of Boeing's Starliner spacecraft, but it will too end at some point later in this decade. Both Delta and Atlas are being replaced by Vulcan, which successfully flew back in January of this year. However, the SLS rocket will fly at least two more times with the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, a modified Delta cryogenic second stage. Technology from this upper stage is also incorporated on Japan's H-3 rocket, which just recently had its first successful flight last month. So, in some shape or form, the legacy of Delta will still live on for a few more decades. And the Falcon 9 launches just keep on coming. The third Falcon 9 launch of the week took place on April 10th at 540 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The mission, Starlink Group 648, successfully carried another batch of Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage for this mission, B-1083, was flying for a second time, quite a rookie, and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship Just Read the Instructions. With the Starlink launches this week, SpaceX has now launched a total of 6,189 Starlink satellites, of which 402 have re-entered and 5,196 have entered their operational orbit. All the way across the world, we had the first Angara launch from the Vostochny Cosmodrome in Russia. The Angara A5 rocket lifted off on April 11th at 9 o'clock UTC, and it was carrying a dummy payload as ballast for this mission. This was the fourth test flight of the Angara A5 rocket, which carries five boosters as the first and second stage of the rocket. Its third stage is a modified version of the Soyuz third stage. The rocket was carrying a fourth operational stage for this mission, nicknamed Orion, which seems to be the name given for the Block DM-03 stage when flown from Vostochny. This upper stage had failed on the previous Angara A5 flight back in 2021 when it launched as Persei from Plisetsk. The Angara A5 rocket is currently the most capable rocket in Russia, but despite that, the country doesn't seem to have any payloads for it. So far, it's launched four times, and all four times, it's carried a dummy payload as ballast. To wrap up the week's launches, we had another Falcon 9 from Vandenberg lifting off on April 11th at 1425 UTC. 
This time, it was carrying the USS F-62 mission into a sun-synchronous orbit. The payload for the USS F-62 mission was the U.S. Space Force Weather System follow-on microwave satellite. This satellite will be used for environmental data collection and weather forecasting for the U.S. military. The first stage for this mission, B-1082, was flying for a third time and it successfully returned back to land at SpaceX's landing zone 4, just 400 meters away from the launch mount. This mission was the first time that a pair of flight-proven fairing halves were flying on a national security space launch mission. These fairing halves had previously been used on the USS F-52 mission flown on a Falcon Heavy rocket back in December of last year. This launch also marked, once again, the fastest turnaround time for Space Launch Complex 4 East at exactly four and a half days since the Starlink 8-1 mission. This week, we not only had launches, but also a return from space. The Soyuz MS-24 spacecraft and its crew of three returned from the ISS on April 6th, bringing to a close another crew rotation mission to the orbiting laboratory. The spacecraft undocked from the ISS Rosviet module on April 6th at 3.53 UTC, carrying Roscosmos cosmonaut Oleg Novitsky, NASA astronaut Laurel O'Hara, and Belarusian space participant Marina Vasilevskaya. Novitsky and Vasilevskaya had previously launched just a few weeks ago on the Soyuz MS-25 spacecraft and spent just over 11 days on the ISS on a short visit to the station. On the other hand, O'Hara had launched on this same spacecraft back in September and had spent six months on the ISS as part of Expeditions 69 and 70. About three hours after undocking, the Soyuz MS-24 descent capsule touched down on the steps of Kazakhstan at 717 UTC, bringing each of their missions to a close. Novitsky now adds 13 and a half days to his career in space, for a total of over 545 days spent in orbit. This was the first flight for both Vasilevskaya and O'Hara, who have now spent a total of 13 and a half days and 203 days in space, respectively. As you probably know by now, we had an amazing total solar eclipse this week here in North America. I'm so excited about it, I even changed my earrings for this segment. A ton of us from NSF, myself included, traveled to different places across the path of totality to bring a number of feeds and experiences to our viewers through our own live stream during the event. And if you were on the path of totality or just watching our stream, you probably noticed how hard it was to get to a place with clear skies. For example, I was with Doss up in Rochester, New York, and the sky was completely clouded out, so we weren't able to see directly the eclipse, but it was actually still a really amazing experience. Now, you probably already know the whole deal about eclipses, right? You know, the moon moves in front of the sun, it completely blocks it out for a few minutes, and it brings up this ring of fire around it, which is essentially the sun's corona. Well, Jack, who was in Fort Worth, and Sean, who was in Newport, were a bit luckier than we were and did get to see and capture this effect, including Bailey's beads, which appear right before and after totality as the sun shines through the edges of the moon's surface. You can see how active the sun was during this eclipse, with plasma filaments and prominences clearly visible over the lunar limb. And that's even despite having quite a clean sun, because prior to totality, we were only able to see two or three sunspots, which often correlates with low solar activity. Now, while all of this is how the sun looks during the eclipse, have you ever seen how scary and amazing and weird and eerie and just absolutely incredible the Earth looks during a solar eclipse? We got to see lots of video and pictures of the eclipse from space, and it always looks like this dark void just hovering over the Earth. It's hard to describe, really. So let's take a quick look through some of these. We had live video of it from the ISS, and SpaceX released a video from a Starlink satellite that flew over the eclipse's shadow as well. We also had another company, SEN, that published high-resolution video from its own satellite. Weather satellites in GEO also captured the eclipse, and the Discover satellite captured shots of the eclipse from a distance of 1.5 million kilometers. But none of that compares to seeing how the Earth looks during an eclipse while on Earth. Animals shift their routines, the wind dies down, everything is plunged into night, and a 360-degree sunset appears on the horizon around you. <laughs> While the clouds didn't let us see the actual ring of fire up there that day, I still got to experience all of those other amazing things, and in fact, the cloud coverage even amplified it. People were cheering all over the place, we were all losing our minds, and it was just an unforgettable event. I mean, well, let's hear it from myself as it happened. Oh, it's like God. nighttime outside. This is crazy. There's, There's literally a sunset behind us. There oh is. my there God. A sunset over there. Holy oh, moly, guys. This is. Oh my gosh. 
But I wasn't the only person to be mind blown by this experience. I think Jack got in a few cheers out at Fort Worth too. The 2024 totality lasted for only a few minutes in each city that it traveled over, but the next total solar eclipse in the world will happen in August of 2026 over the Atlantic Ocean, starting in Greenland, passing over Iceland, and then Spain. Regardless of the clouds, don't miss the opportunity to watch it in person if you can. And if you can't, well, who knows? Maybe we'll broadcast another live stream of it as well. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. Have you ever wondered if astronauts watch YouTube in space? Well, they might on VAST's upcoming space station, Haven 1. The company announced this week that it's partnering with SpaceX to install Starlink laser terminals on its future space stations. With these, the station will connect directly to the Starlink network to offer high-speed internet to its crew and payloads. This isn't the first collaboration that the two companies have announced. Last year, VAST first showed its plans for Haven 1, which is a small single-module space station set to launch in 2025 on none other than a Falcon 9 rocket. It'll then be visited by astronauts during two Crew Dragon missions. Haven 1 is the first in vast lineup of space stations that spin to provide artificial gravity. If launched on schedule, it'll be the first commercial space station. And with Starlink, the Wi-Fi signal is set to be strong. The European Space Agency has contracted Thales Alenia Space to build an entry, descent, and landing module for the ExoMars 2028 mission. With this, the agency's Rosalind Franklin rover finally has a new ride to the Red Planet, where it will analyze the surface and drill deep into the Martian soil. The mission was originally planned for 2018 as a collaboration between ESA and the Russian space agency Roscosmos. The mission was first delayed to 2020 for financial reasons, and then again to 2022 due to the pandemic. Finally, the project was suspended in March of 2022 after collaboration ceased following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now, Thales Alenia Space is tasked to dust off the existing hardware and prepare it for its new mission. Okay, the rover's stored in a clean room though, so actually dusting probably isn't needed, but you get the idea. The mission's currently scheduled to launch in late 2028, and this time it's set to launch on a US rocket chosen by NASA as part of ESA's partnership with the US Space Agency. Under this schedule, the rover would arrive on Mars in 2030. This week, we saw Rocket Lab begin offering its composites manufacturing capabilities to other companies. The company uses carbon composites for the main structure of its electron rocket and the upcoming and much larger neutron rocket. With these, the company has built up expertise in designing and developing carbon composite products, which it's now offering alongside its manufacturing and testing capabilities. This came just days before the company also declared that it had moved a flight-proven electron booster into the production line to prepare it for an upcoming flight. The booster previously flew on the four-of-a-kind mission back in January and has passed post-launch acceptance testing. This first stage will undergo qualification testing to ensure that it's up to the same standard as a new first stage before flying again. NASA has announced that it signed an agreement with Japan for the agency's Artemis program. Under this agreement, Japan would deliver a pressurized rover to be used for crewed and uncrewed operations on the lunar surface. In return, NASA would provide the launch and delivery of the rover to the lunar surface, as well as two opportunities for Japanese astronauts to land on the moon under the Artemis program. This announcement comes just one week after NASA released the candidate slated to develop unpressurized lunar rovers. The pressurized rover will be built in part by Toyota, who already had an early concept of it in recent years. Under the agreement, this pressurized rover would begin to be used no earlier than the Artemis 7 mission when NASA expects to stretch the amount of time that astronauts will spend on the lunar surface and the amount of distance traveled is expected to increase as well. And now let's see what's coming up next week in spaceflight. Later tonight, we'll have a record-breaking Falcon 9 launch from Florida. The mission, Starlink Group 649, will feature the first time a Falcon booster will be flying for its 20th time. With liftoff scheduled for April 13th at 1.22 UTC, the mission will also break the pad turnaround time at Space Launch Complex 40, bringing it from just under four days to just under three days. Next week, we'll also have the potential launch of a Chongzheng 2D rocket from Zhou Chen carrying a currently unknown payload. The 18-minute launch window is set to open on April 15th at 4.10 UTC. Another Falcon 9 launch is set to take place next week from Launch Complex 39A, carrying another batch of Starlink satellites. The four-hour launch window is set to open on April 17th at 2124 UTC. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. We'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.